Okay, so now we are looking at specific posters at the poster session at this year's AMTA convention. Uh, and, and I forgot to mention, of course, that uh, Kim Goral, our, our afternoon presenter on, on uh, poster sessions, actually has her own poster here. Uh, and so this is the first of our series. Uh, Kim, tell us a little bit about what this poster uh, is about uh, and what was the research question you guys were trying to answer with this particular study? Yeah, well, I worked with another student um, when I was at the University of Wisconsin South, uh, Megan Thomason, and we each did a separate case study, but we were looking at the same things. Um, so we each worked on a separate participant uh, for a series of sessions, 10 to 15 set massage sessions, and these participants were clinically anxious, they had clinical levels of anxiety, um, and we were trying to get a better understanding of not just does massage reduce anxiety, because there's already been a lot of research on that, but what specifically is changing um, physically, physiologically during massage. So what we measured was their levels of anxiety and also their stature. Um, this is working on an old theory, uh, the James Lang theory, where they proposed that your feedback or your emotions were a result of feedback from your body, so physiological changes. So you're not anxious because of an outside stimulus, but you're anxious because of your body is reacting in a certain way and we propose that your posture may have something to do with that. So we measured anxiety and stature before and after each session and found uh, pretty strong relationships between the two such that when you were more anxious you were shorter and when you were less anxious you were taller. So after each session participants were always less anxious and taller. And it actually followed so you can see on these charts, I'm not sure how well you can see them, but Dots and lines. Um, <laughs> dots and lines that represent the markers. So we have a level of anxiety here and stature here. And you can actually see some of these where they were higher anxiety, such as here, they were really compressed. And up here, lower anxiety and uh, you know their stature really changed. And we're talking millimeters, but that's significant. This explains why I'm just the model of calm and I also have excellent posture. Very well, what I found most interesting, that's a joke, um, <laughs> what I found most interesting about this study is that you were, first of all, has anything like this correlation ever been looked at? Posture and anxiety? I, not in the context of massage therapy. Um, so there have been other studies that look at posture and emotion and feedback. So, for example, there's a study that was done um, where they would have people assume certain postures. They wouldn't tell them, you know, be depressed, but they would say, okay, lean forward, put your head down, something to that effect, and ask them to generate positive and negative feelings. And they have found that when you're in a kind of hunched over posture, it's easier to generate negative feelings and positive feelings. And when you're, you know, sitting up, shoulders back, nice and tall, it's easier to generate the more positive feelings and the negative feelings. So in that context, it has been looked at, but not in the context of massage. So I've heard you talk about this a couple times, and I never got uh, that that you're you're theorizing at least that it's that if massage is capable of producing postural change on a structural level, then you're actually able through that mechanism perhaps to effect change in anxiety. That is one of our theories. Because um, right now we know that massage does reduce anxiety. That's been so shown in study after study, um, but. Nobody yet has been able to determine exactly why that is. How is that change coming about? So that that is our working theory. I also like the, the other cool thing that you did, which I've seen a lot of massage studies that have looked at posture and just sort of done photographs, or they have measured various landmarks. But you were going for a, a pretty local precision with how you were measuring posture, and you found that in the photographs you were taking, the only the only way to do it really accurately and really numerically accurate postural analysis is in the photographs you looked at the pupils of the eyes. Yeah, and we actually found the midpoint between them. So you can see in our pictures here, we had a posture chart that was attached to the doorway, and we had a camera mounted on a tripod that was never moved, so that we were always able to take a picture from the exact same angle, and this is a before picture and an after picture. And the difference, again, it's millimeters, but you can see in this picture, her head is well below that line. And in the after picture, it's actually a little bit above it. And also her shoulders are a little bit more even in the after picture as well, as well as her torso. Um, so what we did was we would project these pictures onto a dry erase board 
set up a grid there and um, place markers where the pupils are, measure them, find the midpoint, and then find the change that way. So this is this is kind of what is almost the ideal case report in the sense that you're the vanguard. You're looking at a wholly new way of asking a question. And what is the hope? Like, if, if, you had, if you had your perfect wishes and someone would read this study, someone with the desire to do research or the desire to repeat another case study, um, what would you hope that they did to stand on your shoulders? Um, well, obviously this is two separate case studies, uh, N of two, so we need to expand this. And I actually did that in my thesis research. We expanded it to seven. Um, but still, we could use the more numbers, the better to understand is this really a pattern or was this just you know, a random occurrence? Because um, obviously in a case study, you can determine interesting things, but you're not determining cause and effect. And that's really it's important for us to say that again and again. Case studies, case reports don't prove anything, but that is not speaking to their value. They are incredibly valuable and we need more of them. Absolutely. It's just a great place to start to look for different observations and find new things, um, low budget, low resources, and any massage therapist out there can do this. Well, I know you're busy. you got a big class to teach. You've got a lot of people to get turned on to this type of material, and I appreciate it. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, thank you for your case study, and, uh, and, uh, and good luck. Thank you.